Bridgepoint Capital, and we have our esteemed guest, Randy Cohen from Harvard Business School, on with us as well. I'll call this part two of the session that we started last Thursday, where Randy was describing uh, impact of inflation, what the Fed is doing to combat inflation, what are some of the investment strategies you should deploy in a rising rate environment. And honestly, it was so compelling and so comprehensive that we didn't feel like we did enough justice for a one session podcast. So consider this part B of last session's podcast. Plus, we have a bonus because not only did Randy describe inflation and investment strategies to, to deal with that, he also mentioned something called the inelastic markets hypothesis. So I'll simplify it and Randy will correct me, but I consider this the money multiplier effect of buying stock. So that also will be something we will cover on this podcast. And I really feel like this is something is not understood or priced into the market. So you're getting something that I'll say is hot off the press and could be something that could benefit you in the future. So that's what we're going to cover today. And I apologize for being a couple minutes late. We had some technical glitches on our side. Surprise, surprise. But we're good to go now. So I apologize for being a couple minutes late. But here we are. So I'll ask Charles to, and he just advanced the slide. So we can't have a presentation without a disclaimer. And this is our disclaimer. And bottom line, we're encouraged, we're empowered to do education. And this disclaimer says, if you're getting investment advice, that is not the intention of this podcast. And if you do take investment advice from this podcast, certainly vet it, run it by your investment professionals, et cetera. So don't blindly just take anything that you think is investment advice from Bridgepoint and run with it. So this is something that we do every session to remind you that's our disclaimer. So let's go to the next slide. So obviously, if you've been on a previous podcast, you know the Mark Young story. And I'm going to just ask Randy briefly, and honestly, he could spend an hour on his esteemed career. But Randy, you want to just give the audience a few highlights of your professional career? Oh, sure. Um, well, I'm a finance professor at Harvard Business School. I now teach entrepreneurship as well as finance. For most of my career, I taught investment management. And, uh, and in fact, I have an online course uh, called Alternative Investments that anybody can take. Uh, if you're willing to pay Harvard Business School some money, hey, we got, we got bills to pay. Uh, but, uh, but I do think it's a terrific course. I did it together with my colleagues, Arthur Siegel, who's maybe the world's expert on real estate, and uh, Victoria Ibashina, who is a brilliant uh, uh, professor, studies uh, private equity and banking and related fields, and is our, also our, our department head. And, um, and uh, I think it's uh, terrific. I, I also teach a class uh, called Field X which is an incubator for startup businesses. And if you like investing in startup businesses, you should uh, come to our pitch day. Uh, shoot me an email, randy at hbs.edu, and uh, we'll connect you up uh, because, and, and you can come in person here at Harvard. It's incredibly fun. Or if you can't make it to Boston, uh, you can join by Zoom. And my students are looking for investors. They're looking for advice and wisdom and connections. And if you have those things to offer, we'd love to uh, have you help us out in Field X in the fall and then uh, Field Y uh, in the spring. Uh, we've got 73 teams this semester starting real life businesses and, and I would guess a couple dozen of those, uh, two, three dozen will end up getting funded and, and have real uh, successful businesses. We've had some amazing success stories in the past. Uh, so that's on the teaching side. And then I do research um, on financial economics and I try to understand markets. I've done a lot of research in equity markets, uh, some stuff in fixed income. And I would say most of my research in the last decade or so has been on manager selection and portfolio construction. So not so much about how to find the very best stocks, although I am interested in those questions, but how to find the managers who can find the best stocks, the best bonds, and put them in the right structure and combine them together to make a great wealth management portfolio. And so that's probably my number one uh, interest in terms of uh, investments. Um, uh, in terms of uh, on the research side, um, I also uh, do um, uh, work on a bunch of projects on Wall Street. Obviously, you can't sit in the ivory tower and think you really understand what's happening on Wall Street. So, of course, I work with Mark at Bridgepoint and, and Nadia and the whole team, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I have uh, I helped start a company 
called PEO Partners that does uh, liquid private equity, uh, which is something I'll talk about at the drop of a hat because I think liquid private equity is absolutely fascinating. The idea of delivering PE style performance, but in a liquid vehicle that gives you accessibility and flexibility and liquidity. Um, and then I also I'm involved with uh, with uh, several other projects in the investment world. I've uh, run across some really amazing stuff uh, for tax management purposes for people who are interested in, in looking at super efficient investments that have great uh, tax uh, that, that basically save you a lot on your taxes. That's, that's something I've been getting involved with. Um, uh, I write about pro basketball professionally, uh, about my hometown Philadelphia 76ers. I have a podcast about blindness. I'm, I'm blind. And so uh, I, uh, I, uh, I have a podcast called Dangerous Vision, where I talk about I talk to interesting people connected to the world of blindness um, and uh, a million other things. But that'll, that'll, that'll get the conversational ball rolling. Well, I, like I said to the audience, Randy could spend an hour talking about his, his professional career. <laughs> I didn't use the whole hour, did I? No, no, it's great. I love it. Just your you know, you're an amazing person. So, uh, Jerry, if you'd be kind enough to go to the next screen. So this will look familiar again, if you've been on a previous podcast, but I like this because it really reinforces at least the vision the Bridgepoint has about how to help people in private wealth. So on the left, you see a chair with three legs on it. So your net worth is one of those items in the drawing. And your net worth is a combination of your investable assets and your non-investable assets. Well, you might say, what's a non-investable asset? It could be your home. It could be jewelry, art, other collectibles. The combination of your investables and non-investables is your net worth, A plus B. On top of that, trust estate planning is also really crucial to not only ensure your financial goals are achieved when you pass on. And, and as uh, Jim Morrison said, nobody gets out of here alive. Uh, and secondly, there's ways to build financial moats around your net worth because in America, anybody can sue anybody for any at any time for any reason. So if you have wealth, you're a financial target and don't miss the opportunity to create those financial moats. Next item is tax planning. And as I tell people, a monkey can fill out a tax form. That's not where the real talent lies. The talent lies in tax planning, a future taxable event, so it can be structured presently to reduce your tax burden later. And the beauty of that service, that solution, you can document to the penny the value you created. It's, it's black and white. So there's a lot of clever things that we do there to minimize people's tax burden. And lastly, insurance. And again, Bridgepoint is not an insurance broker. However, there's a particular insurance policy that we like a lot for high net worth people called private placement life insurance. I simply stated, I call it another deferred tax vehicle, much like your Roth IRAs, your 401ks, your IRAs. Those are vehicles you put investments in that compound tax free until you withdraw. And the same opportunity exists in private placement life. There's some more bells and whistles to it. I'm not going to do it justice on this call, but that to us is, is what wealth management's about. Okay, next slide, Jerry. And this, again, will be, I think, very useful for the conversation today to talk about how to deal with inflation and generating current income. If you look at the right there in the box, this is the efficient portfolio that we aspire people to embrace. So if you look at it, 40% of your 100% investables should be in equity. Bear in mind, half of that can and should be in things like private equity and venture capital if, if, if you can take the lockup. If you can't take the lockup, we recommend primarily owning index items like exchange-traded funds that own the global stock market. So we're not advocates of owning single-name stocks. <coughs> Excuse me. Unless you have an information advantage that the market doesn't have. You should have a, a valid reason for owning a single name stock. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Market neutral hedge funds, 30%, 15%. <coughs> <excuse> me. <coughs> Getting choked up here. 15% inflation sensitive. We're in an inflationary period. So we're going to spend a good amount of time now talking about inflation, what, investments tend to do well during an inflationary period. But bear in mind, this is an all-weather portfolio. It's designed 
so you don't have to market time. So it's going to benefit during periods of deflation and or inflation. And we're definitely in a period of inflation. So, Jerry, next slide, please. Okay, this is to set the stage for us to, frankly, pick Randy's brain, which is extensive. But the setting is as follows. August, C CPI committed 8.3%. By the way, inflation in June peaked at 9%. That's a 40-year high of inflation. So not surprising, the Fed is the steward to maintain controlled inflation. Their inflation target is 0 to 2%. And here we are, June high of 9%, so way, way above their target. So not surprisingly, the monetary tool of choice of the Fed is controlling short-term interest rates through the Fed funds rate. And they've dramatically raised the Fed funds rate, and it's per presently sitting at 3 to 3.25. They've moved it 75 basis points now three consecutive times. And there is something in the market called uh, the futures, which is a way for participants to essentially speculate on future directions of the Fed. And net-net at present, the market is expecting another 1% from the Fed in 2022. So three and a quarter will become four and a quarter. And honestly, and I'd love Randy's thoughts on this before we get into the heart of this discussion, are we going to hit a recession next year? You know, flip a coin. I'm not sure anyone has a firm grip on the answer to that. But if the Fed's rate hikes don't do the job of, slowing the economy and getting inflation back under control, they'll keep going. So where's the top or <laughs> on the rate rises or the bottom of the market? Randy, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I, have, uh, I have lots of thoughts. So uh, stop me when you're sick of, uh, of hearing from me. So um, uh, let's talk about how much inflation there is right now, because that is a, is a tr trickier question than it seems. Um, at HBS, we love our two by two grids. And this situation lends itself to a two by two grid. So think of the left and right of the grid uh, as either you're looking at inflation over the past year, or you're just looking at what happened in the past month. Okay. And then think of the top and bottom as being either you're looking at headline inflation or you're looking at core inflation. Okay. So the numbers you quoted, Mark, are entirely reasonable numbers to look at. They are the headline number for the last year. And that is the right number to look at if you're trying to figure out how much people are hurting, right? And how much they're feeling the bite of inflation, right? And so the answer is 8.3% headline inflation over the last year. That's the total across all the stuff they buy. And it's for a year. So it's really piled up on them. And of course, some people have gotten pay raises and most people got pay raises that are less than that inflation rate, which is bad news from the perspective of them not being able to pay their bills. It's good news from the perspective of uh, resisting the famed, uh, terrifying wage price spiral, where if people start to get pay increases that are above inflation, then uh, in order to pay their people, uh, companies need to raise prices on the goods they sell. And then that creates more inflation and then the workers demand more and that's the spiral, right? So as long as the pay increases are below, although it makes it very tough on people in terms of their day-to-day -day lives, uh, it may make it less likely that we run into that scary inflationary spiral. Okay, so that's one corner of the grid. Headline inflation, last 12 months. So let's talk about core inflation, right? So core inflation over the last 12 months is somewhat lower. I think it's around six. Um, and so the question is, well, is that, uh, why would we care about the core? Core, of course, it's, it's food and energy. So in a sense, this is the craziest thing to do, right? Because food and energy are the most important things people need for their survival while we're sheltered, right? So to, to say let's not include those takes you further away from what people are feeling in their lives. But the reason it's useful is that food and energy prices are very volatile. And so if you're looking not to see how much pain people are in, but what's going to happen next year? Well, if energy prices just went way up, that's probably not a sign that they're about to take another giant leg up. It's probably a sign you're going to see some mean reversion and they're going to come down. And if that's true, then the core inflation is a better predictor of future inflation than the, um, uh, than, than the headline. Okay. So then uh, we say, okay, well, that's somewhat lower. Okay. So then we say, what about the recent inflation? Well, that's another move in the direction of putting less weight on how people are feeling, but more weight on what's about to happen. 
Because after all, if you have low inflation right now over the last couple of months, that might suggest that we're not going to have huge amounts of inflation in the future. So in fact, inflation over the last couple of months has been slightly negative, right? Been a little below zero. So I would say, oh my gosh. But then you say, well, wait a minute, why is it below zero? And the answer is, well, it's because gas prices got really high and now they've come back down. Okay, let's pause for a second and ask, why did that happen? Well, it's pretty straightforward, right? What ha- you, you, I, I think I may have said this on the last call, so it'll be super fast. Uh, a year, like two years ago, oil prices went negative. Um, so people stopped drilling for oil, right? They shut down production or they didn't open up new production. Um, and demand was very low because of COVID. People weren't driving. Then uh, the economy's picked up. People are driving more. Industrial activity is picked up. We're using more fuel. And so you need more fuel. So then prices skyrocketed because there wasn't any fuel out there to meet that demand. Um, then, of course, people immediately go and start opening up oil fields and opening up refineries, but it takes time to do it. And so the oil business and the, the refinery business is catching up to the demand. And that's why we see prices coming down and the gas prices have come down like 15 straight weeks or something like that, 12 straight weeks. Um, and that is cutting into inflation. So then you say, all right, maybe we should look at core short term, right? Well, the core short term has been about 0.4% over the last few months. And the reason the market freaked out on the last inflation announcement was we had like 2.4s and a 0.3. And people are like, maybe it's going to be another 0.3. Maybe the core short term is really coming down and we're getting to where we need to go. And then we got a 0.6 on the core short term. 0.6 for one month is 7.2% for the year, right? So it was like, oh, crap. Now it's a tiny difference. If it had been 0.4, people would have been pretty pretty mellow. And instead it was 0.6, so over 2.2% on core inflation is the difference between people being feeling like the problem is getting under control and freaking out. And so we'll see what happens next time. So by looking at these different measures of inflation, you get different lenses onto what's going on. And so in the end, what I would say is, look, if you ask my opinion, I think on the one hand, inflation is close to being under control and that the Fed is raising rates and the Fed is very likely to drive us into recession with these rate hikes. And what I mean by that is the reaction to the rate hikes takes months. Think about an example of how a rate hike affects the economy. What happens is you push up rates, and so the mortgage rates go up. And so then people who were going to buy a house and do not to buy it because it's too expensive to borrow the money. So then the house stays the way it is. And then that construction work doesn't get done, right? So if you raise rates today, does that change how much construction is getting done? Or 12 months ago, right? Uh, but um, will it have an effect down the road on how much construction gets done? It absolutely will have an effect. So uh, what the concern is that the Fed did all these rate hikes that are going to have a huge effect on economic activity, you know, from from starting sort of now-ish to, to 12 months from now. But it hasn't hit things yet. And so you're going to overshoot raise rates too much, and then you're going to blast the economy when inflation's already kind of been conquered by, you know, people not spending as much and, uh, you know, by, by people having spent uh, all their all their stimulus checks and all that stuff. Now, why is this not a criticism of Jerome Powell? Um, the reason is, I think he kind of has to do this. And what I mean by that is, there's an asymmetric as bad as a recession would be, and it would be bad, and it will, if it, you know, I think it's quite likely to be to happen and to be bad. Um, if he blows it, if he does not show sufficient resolve in fighting inflation right now, everybody expects that inflation is going to get under control, that he is going to do whatever it takes to conquer inflation, right? If people start to think he's not willing to do what it takes to conquer inflation, then people start demanding raises, people start raising prices, and then you could end up with inflation that is really, really um, persistent and hard to get rid of. And so what he's saying is, you know, if you've got cockroaches in your house, you've got to go over the the roach traps and the roach poison and every possible and make absolutely sure you've gotten rid of it. Um, and, and he's going to have to gamble that maybe there will be a recession, but hopefully not. And if it is, hopefully it's not too deep, but he's just got to do it because you can't take a chance in the other direction. So that was a long, long answer, but you know, you asked, I had a lot to say. Well, I'm going to ask you a different question and I'll call this unintended consequences. So bottom line with the fed rate increase, have been aggressive and perhaps justifiably so. 
one of the outcrops of this is the U.S. dollar is extremely strong. Right. And it's causing, I'll say, dislocation. At the moment, I want you to look at Europe. If you don't mm -hmm. mind, talk about the U.K. The pound is under a dollar now. Right. I lived there Amazing. for five years when it was 1.5 to 1.7. So, right. you know, this is a big, big change. And, yeah. you know, the banking systems in Europe starting to, you know, fracture a little bit. And we all know from the 2008 financial crisis that the banks are all intertwined. They all work together. They all transact together. So the counterparty credit risk in the banking system is a big deal. You can't just say that's a European problem, not a U.S. problem, mm -hmm. because right. global banks are all connected. So how does this play out? And does this hit Powell's radar screen as far as what he's doing to global markets? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's scary. Um, you know, uh, and, and then the question is, so so how do you fix that? Well, then, you know, Europe was slow to raise rates relative to the U.S., right? Powell was too slow to raise rates. Looking back. You know, I'm not saying I would have done any better. I'm sure I'd have screwed it up a million ways, you know. Uh, but looking back, we can say, oh, gosh, he should have started hiking rates sooner, right? And then the effects would be kicking in now, and maybe inflation would be kind of squashed already and we could stop raising rates now or whatever. But easy to say in retrospect. Anyway, relative to Europe, he looks like he was a smart first mover, right? Because Europe took even longer to take action. And as a result, as you say, our rates are higher, dollars strengthen. Uh, now Europe has to decide what to do, and they're stuck because uh, you know part of them wants to say, okay, yeah, we need to raise rates, we need to quash inflation, we need to strengthen our currency, and then, but then, um, but you know, there are, there are consequences to that uh, too in terms of you know bond prices get smashed, um, and uh, people are um, you know get, you know government deficits go up because that those are interest rates are on, at which they're borrowing, and so it, it, it caused a huge increase in the government deficit. So um, you know they're struggling with the decisions there, just like we're, we are here. And you're absolutely right that uh, if um, if countries make different choices, they can things can get out of balance in ways that are damaging. And I think you're right to remind us because now it's been a long time since 2008, 2009 that if things go so badly that it ends up screwing up the global banking system, uh, the cost of that can be extremely high. And after the global financial crisis or during and after, a real effort was made both in the US and Europe to put in safeguards uh, that will hopefully protect us from having something as bad as the GFC again. Uh, but you know, the bank industry worked very hard over the 14 years in between trying to unwind some of those safeguards to give themselves more flexibility to, to develop big profits. And, you know, sometimes the government pushed back, sometimes it didn't. Um, so I don't think anybody really, really knows uh, how well protected we are against uh, another crisis of that type. So I don't want to scaremonger. I mean, my guess is it's fine. Uh, but I, my guess was it was fine in 2007 going into 2008, and I was wrong. So it shows what I know. Well, it just shows you we're in uncertain times. And I can tell you with hand over heart, the one thing stock markets can take is good news and bad news. It's uncertainty that they can't take. And we're building an uncertainty bubble here, and hopefully it doesn't trigger the kind of situation we had in 2008. But we'll, we'll have to just watch it and see how it goes. So. Mark, that, Mark I, have a, I have a question for you. Yeah. Who, who, blew up, who blew up the gas pipeline? Who blew up Nord Stream? Good question. So uh, uh, the, the smartest guy I know called me three months ago and said, obviously, it's in the world's interest that that pipeline get blown up. Yeah. Now, now I, by the way, I, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting he blew it up. Um, and he said, obviously, it's in the world's interest because Putin is going to use the gas supply to try to force, to try to make, he's going to cut off the gas and then he's going to wait until it gets cold and then he's going to try to make European people so miserable that they demand of their political leaders that they stop supporting Ukraine and cave to Putin so that Putin will turn the gas back on. And so if you are a person who does not want Europe to cave because you support Ukraine or because you oppose Russia or because you think Europe needs to stand firm together for democracy or for whatever reason, then you would really like to see that pipeline destroyed because then, uh, you know, this is, uh, you remember the old movie Speed about the bus that can't slow down too much, right? And, and Dennis Hopper is a bad guy, you know, that explains that Keanu Reeves, you know, that the way to handle a hostage situation is shoot the hostage. That way you take the, <laughs> the bad guy's leverage away, right? So you got to shoot the hostage. Okay. So, uh, by the way, again, I'm not recommending anybody shoot any hostage. I do not recommend blowing up like ones <laughs> or shooting hostages. We are a clean, nonviolent podcast here. Okay. So, and he told me, and he said, and by the way, so he said, here's the thing about it. 
You don't need a vote of parliament to blow up the pipeline. All you need is like three commandos with explosives to blow up the pipeline. So somebody's going to blow that pipeline up, right? That's what he said to me. And he said, by the way, when it happens, the European papers are going to say it was Russia that did it, even though that makes no sense whatsoever. It's totally not in Russia's strategic interest to blow up the pipeline. They can just turn off the gas at their end. In fact, they already have, yeah. right? So yesterday, so, you know, the day before, somebody blew up the pipeline. And sure enough, I'm seeing reported everywhere that people think it was Russia that did it. I cannot make head or tail of that theory. I mean, I can, I mean, if you, if I'm dead, if you say it's Randy's job to lawyer for the theory <laughs> that Russia blew it up, I could come up with some triple twisting gainer explanation. But that makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I was just wondering if you thought it was Russia and maybe you had a better theory than I've heard. I, clearly, I agree with you that, you know, it's highly, highly unlikely that Russia would have done it for the reasons you articulated. But interestingly enough, yesterday, I was having a chat with someone, again, about these unintended consequences. So wood in Europe is now being hoarded because yeah. it's going to be a cold winter. So yeah. you're seeing all the ripple effects of the energy disruption and what it's doing to the local local That's economy right. of Europe. So if you are going back to Europe, bring some logs with you, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Bring, bring, bring some liquefied natural gas if you can. Exactly. They, um, not as easy. Okay. so. Randy, I want to just briefly touch on the last time we were here. People were asking some, I'll say, implementation questions. So we talked about I-bonds. We talked about TIPS. So on the screen, we basically have a little more granularity about TIPS. Uh, the I-bonds, I think we touched on enough. But just to remind people, I-bonds or savings bonds where the interest rate is correlated to CPI. Right now, I bonds are paying over nine percent per family member. You can buy ten thousand bucks of I bonds per year. Um, I think if you have a cash refund, you can buy yeah, another five thousand worth. That's right. If you get a cash refund, you can buy a little bit extra. Yeah. So you can look into that. And then the key is you can buy them every year, and then if the rate goes down, and you don't like them anymore. You can just cash them in and get your money back. And, you know, you don't have a a thing where with the rate change you experience any kind of loss you just you just hold them as long as the rate seems attractive to you and you don't need the money for something more important and then you can just cash them in anytime so they're just it's just a ridiculously good deal that the government decided to get it, it, it's it's uh I, I forget if i said this last time mark but you know the, the atlantic monthly ran an article a few years ago called the war on stupid people and <laughs> it's like there's just all this stuff out there where it's like if you're if you're smart and really smart isn't really the right word if you're knowledgeable if you're plugged in there's just these extraordinary opportunities. And there's lots and lots of people out there who have $10,000, so they can take advantage. They're not too poor to take advantage of it, but they, they, they're just not going to know about this because they don't listen to this podcast, don't read the Wall Street Journal, they don't have the friends that you and I have, Mark, who call us when there's cool opportunities and let us know. And um, and so uh, it's uh, in some ways it's it's a little bit frustrating because it doesn't, it doesn't seem like the world should work that way, but just like if you're plugged in the right networks, you get all these extra opportunities. But uh, given that it does, all I can say to you is everyone you know, like plug them into this opportunity. Just let them know this is something everybody should invest in. Okay, that's on the I bonds. On the tips, you don't have, I'll just say, the investment minimums that apply to I bonds. So pretty or much. Maximums. You don't have a maximum. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, pardon me. You don't right, have a so this you can put millions of dollars into if you, if you like. That's, that's right. right. It's not as juicy, but you're not capped at $10,000 per family. Definitely. And there's lots of ways to get the tips exposure. You can buy it directly through the Fed. You can buy funds, whether it's a Fidelity or a Vanguard. Uh, there's ETFs dedicated to tips as well. So this is something that pretty much anybody can get access to. So at, yeah. the, at the moment, new tips are yielding over 8%. So again, looking at... Yeah, you, no, I, well, I do want to be careful with that because... So I want to say, and then I want to say something about long-term tips. So the short-term tips, I haven't looked in the last day but yeah, two days ago, it was paying just under 4% plus inflation, right. okay? And now we're back to that question, well, what's inflation going to be between now and January? Let's say for the tips, it's just three and a half months away, right? And the answer is, well, if you look at the last year, it's eight, and you're getting eight and four is 12. But maybe it won't be eight because maybe fuel prices will keep falling, or maybe fuel prices are about to start going up as winter comes, right? So I don't know what inflation is going to be. But I agree with Mark that if you think inflation is going to be four to six percent which i think is very realistic for the next few months um it's, it's at least as likely to be higher than that as lower and you're looking at eight to ten percent 
uh, as in annualized, I'm going to be careful with that too, annualized yield. But, you know, for something that's a three-month instrument, to get annualized yield at height is very, very exciting. And even if inflation's zero, you're going to make 3.75%, which is a hell of a lot, or 3.85, or whatever the number is, right, which is a hell of a lot more than the bank pays. And I do want to say one other word, which is the long-term tips have gotten extremely interesting. I'm uh, Again, I'm a day and a half out of date. I looked at this yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon, the like the 28-year tips or whatever it was paying inflation plus 1.8. Now, I'm not saying 28-year inflation is going to be super high. I don't think it will be. I think they're totally going to get inflation under control. But just for comparison, in November, that bond was paying inflation minus a half. You were getting a half a percent less than the inflation rate over the next 28 years. Now you get almost 2% above inflation. So two things. Number one, that is an interesting investment on its own, right? I would seriously consider buying some of those bonds. If, I, if you have a portfolio, it's kind of you want to have a diversified portfolio of all your assets. Because you get inflation protection, you get a pretty high leak. Just Suppose you just think inflation is going to be 2%. Well, then you're getting 3.8%. 3.8 is meaningfully above the 30-year bond, last I love. And it's a safer security because if inflation's high, you'll get more. If inflation's low, you'll get less. That sounds pretty great, right? And I would seriously think about, look at that uh, relative to the stock market. In other words, when you think about whether the stock market is fairly priced or not, that inflation, that interest rate has moved from minus a half to 1.8. That is a 2.3% move, okay? Now, if you guys remember back to, you know, learning uh, learning intro pants, right, the, the concept of duration, you take the duration of a bond times the interest rate move, it tells you how much the bond should move. The stock market has a duration of probably 30 to 50. In other words, you're going to get dividends paid over hundreds of years, but, you know, most of the value is sort of 30, you know, the average is like 30, 50 years in the future. You multiply that by a 2.3% interest rate change, the stock market should be down more than half, right? But it's only down like 25%. So that makes you think the market might have more room to fall. But if you don't want to bet against the market, it's fine. Just buy some of these tips bonds. In other words, either the tips bonds are a bargain or the stock market is too expensive. And so I would seriously think about taking some money from the markets into those long-term tips bonds. Well, I, I agree with you, and that's very well said, Randy. So thank you. So other ways to get current income in the market, we've mentioned the government securities between the I-bonds and tips. So another way to get yield is through dividend paying equities. So on the screen, I just showed a couple examples. And again, the yield, I believe the markets are relatively efficient. So in this case, there's a Global X Super Dividend ETF. Okay, it's a global index targeting highest dividend paying companies. And that annual dividend yield today is about 13%. Now, that's extraordinarily high. If someone was to seriously take a look at that, you'd have to understand the underlying risk of that portfolio, understand other, you're sure there's currency risk associated with that. But as a U.S. investor and foreign currency re, reprice in dollars to calculate the return, that dollar strength is already reflected. The question is incrementally going forward, will the dollar dramatically increase its level vis-a-vis -vis these foreign stocks from today forward? I, I couldn't tell you that, but that's something to consider. But bottom line, 13% dividend yield for the CTF is pretty rich. And the Spider S&P 500 dividend ETF today is paying about 3.7%. And again, this is subject to change, markets move, but 80 stocks in the S&P 500, which they aggregated into an ETF, currently is paying about 3.7. So there's so, definitely- uh, So let me, just, let me just make a comparison to that market and explain why that's exciting. This is probably obvious to most of the people in the audience here, but it's just, it never hurts to remind ourselves of first principles. So in other words, if you buy a, a bond, right? If you buy a 30-year bond, maybe it's paying three and a half or something like that. So you're getting three and a half percent a year in coupon. And then at the end, you'll get your money back in 30 years, right? If you buy these, uh, if you buy uh, uh, the, the security Mark's talking about, it's paying you a dividend in that same 3.5%, 3.75% range. But you can probably reasonably expect those dividends to at least grow at 2% a year with inflation over the next few decades. So, you know, do you want a, a, a $3,500 coupon every year? 
from the bond, or do you want a coupon that's thirty five hundred and then grows two percent and then grows two percent and then grows two percent and then grows two percent? You know, it's a pretty good argument uh, for for that 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 dividend yield. Now, obviously, it's riskier, um, but you have to ask yourself: Is that dividend stream really risky? Sure, the price of the of the underlying stocks may may move up and down. And in fact, I just suggested you concerns about that, right? So, so I'm sort of arguing both sides here, just so you can see. You know why why the financial markets are where they are because there's good arguments in both cases. But with these high dividend payers, there's a pretty good case for those um, relative to bond yields because of because of the uh, the growth over time. Um, and so you know it makes me think. I'm going to mention one other uh, weird security, and I don't have a ticker for you or anything because I, I didn't prep this. I didn't know we're getting dividends, but it's a great point, Mark. So I'm glad you raised it. And that is, there, and there's probably a U.S. version of this, but the one I'm familiar with is in Europe. They sell. A um, uh, a dividend share. They sell a security that just is the dividends of the euro stocks index, right? So you're not buying the whole index; you're just getting the dividends. And that security has traditionally traded consistently cheap, which is to say that if you buy it, you get very good returns by through the through that dividend capture. And so it's a little bit of an oddball security, but there's a lot of good research that suggests. That, that's a great way, and, and and again, you're getting a reduced risk because you know if hard times come, those dividends will go down a little, but it's not very likely that they're going to fall thirty percent the way the stock market might if you get a recession. And so you've got something with a lot less volatility, but a nice expected return. It's a good way to make an equity investment. And I want to be clear: I haven't checked the price recently. I can't swear to you it's trading at bargain prices, but I know that over decades, you know, twenty years now, it tended to trade at bargain prices. So that's something, Mark. Maybe we can put the team on doing a little research on, and, and uh, you know, for. for Whatever the next podcast is, we can dig into a little further. The short answer is absolutely. So thank you for pointing that out to us. Um, Charles, will you advance the slide? So I want to now pivot to the other item we wanted to talk about on this podcast. And Randy, just to refresh your memory, not that you need refreshing because I know you know what I'm about to describe. But on the previous podcast, you mentioned two writers and an article that they published, which you think has a lot of impact that hasn't been fully acknowledged or recognized by the market. It's called the inelastic markets hypothesis. And the aggregate stock market is surprisingly price inelastic so that flows in and out of the market have a significant impact on prices and risk. So I, I have one other data point and honestly, Randy, I'm going to throw it over to you to give us, your thoughts and comments and insights of why you think this is such a keen insight that people should be aware of. Okay. So the data point, and I'll throw it back to you. If you sold a dollar of your bonds and put that dollar into the stock market, the increase of the stock market is more than the dollar you put in. I call it a money multiplier effect, but this paper suggests the dollar into the stock market potentially increases the market value of the overall market by five bucks. That, that's the money multiplier effect that I'm calling it. But Randy, the floor is yours, my friend. So Yeah, so this paper's gotten some publicity. I mean, people don't pay that much attention to finance research papers, but, you know, ideas are fascinating things. You know, you have a big idea, you have a powerful idea. Uh, the day you announce your idea, nothing happens, but slowly over time, the world does change its behavior in response to an idea if it's a good enough idea. And uh, these are two of the very best financial economists in the world, right at the very, very top of the profession, uh, Ralph Koijin and uh, Xavier Gabanks. And um, they, uh, they really did, you know, they really had a, a powerful insight, which was that what most people uh, thought and you know, or still think is that, look, if you buy a dollar or let's just say a billion dollars, if, 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 if you take a billion dollars from, from some big company's pension fund that's sitting in bonds, and you slowly, carefully put it in the stock, right? You don't go nuts and you know buy a billion dollars of Microsoft in 10 seconds. You spread it over a thousand stocks and you do it over the course of an entire quarter. So you know, 60, 70 trading days. So you're only trading a little bit in each stock each day. What almost everybody thought, uh, both on Wall Street and in academia was that would have essentially zero price impact, right? That that billion dollars going into the market wasn't going to move prices up by a billion. It wasn't even going to move prices up by a hundred million. Maybe it would move prices up by a million or two million or nothing. 
okay? Because the market is so huge. The market's $50 trillion. Of course, it's just going to absorb. A billion is one fifty thousand of the market. Why would it have any impact? But um, what Ralph and Chavier show, sort of both theoretically and empirically, is that uh, it really, and, they, and they've got some follow-up work too that explore this more deeply. What they show is the impact is huge, just as you said, Mark, a 5x multiple, not a zero multiple, which is what people thought, or maybe a one multiple, which might be what the most aggressive people thought was, well, maybe if you buy a billion dollars worth, it pushes the price up. Good. No, if you buy a billion dollars worth, it moves the price of the market by $5 billion. And so, uh, and, the, and the fundamental reason is um, there's nobody to naturally take the other side of that transaction. When you buy and you start pushing prices up, mutual funds don't buy, don't sell stock just because prices are going up. Mutual funds are generally 100% invested in stocks or virtually 100. ETFs are 100% invested in stocks at all times, right? Pension funds and endowments, they might have a 60-40 mandate, in which case the prices go up, they might sell a tiny bit in response. But when you add up all the people who are set up to sell in response to increasing prices, it's almost nobody. And then meanwhile, you have retail investors who, if anything, might buy in response to increasing prices, right? They might get excited when they see prices going up and jump in. So there's just nobody really inherently dying to take the other side of that transaction. And so the effect is that the prices really do have to rise significantly, in, inelastically, as you say, Mark, um, in response to uh, in, in response to that. And so then the question is, what are the implications of that? And what I can't say to you is, so this is how you make money. If you see this pattern followed by this pattern, it's not as simple as that. Or maybe it is, but I haven't done the work to, to, to come up with those answers. But what I will say is, you should be much more open than you were before hearing about this paper to the possibility that um, prices are moving not just because of informational effects. The standard financial economist view that you I was trained in at University of Chicago and that I've really held my whole life is, hey, if the price of the market's up 2% like, uh, like it was yesterday, that's because there was good news that the market interpreted probably correctly, not always correctly, but probably correctly, as being worth 2%. Oh, you know, the Bank of England did such and such, and that stabilized the bond market, and so the market went up 2%. It's all perfectly rational. Um, but, and, and, and probably most of the time that's true. But it could also just be the case that, well, something decided to do a bunch of buying, and that moved the prices. And so I'll just mention a couple other papers that are related to this. So there is a super cool paper uh, by um, uh, uh, Hartsmark and Solomon, um, and, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, I actually discussed it at a conference. I really enjoyed this paper. And what they looked at was what happens when companies pay dividends, not when they announce dividends and not on the X dividend day, right? So in other words, the day when they announce, let's say that on March 1st, they say, we are going to pay a dividend. Okay. And we're going to pay it to everybody who is invested in this company on March 20th. And we're going to pay it on March 30th. Okay. So let's just make that and make that. Right. Those probably aren't the right gaps, but it's fine. Okay. So on March 1st, there might be an, an announcement effect. People might say, oh, wow, they paid a healthy dividend and the company must be doing great. Stock might go up. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly rational. On March 20th, when the dividend would be X day, well, if you hold the stock on the 20th, you get the dividend. And if you hold it on the 21st, but not on the 20th, you don't. So if the dividend is a dollar, then you should expect the stock to drop by about a dollar from the 20th to the 21st because it's worth a dollar more on the 20th. From the 20th, you're going to get paid a dollar in cash, and on the 21st, you won't. So, and you kind of see that effect in there, although it's not the full dollar and maybe there's tax component and blah, blah, blah. Nothing should happen on the 30th, right? The 30th is just the day the money arrives, right? There's no reason that you should see any impact on the 30th, on the, on the price. And yet what we see is the stock goes way up on the day the dividend gets paid out. Why is that? Well, what seems to be happening is that um, people who hold the stock um, reinvest the money, okay? And in other words, if you're a mutual fund and you receive the check that day, what are you going to do with the money? Well, you're going to buy stocks. And one of the stocks you're going to buy is a company that has paid you the dividend. And in fact, you might buy a bunch of that because after all, your position in that company went down by the amount of the dividend. So you may take the cash and rebuy that company. And so there's just some buying pressure in that company that day. And those stocks move meaningfully on those days, right? And so that is very, very thought-provoking as an example of this phenomenon, that it really is cash in the market moving the prices, not 
even when there is no information. Usually money and information go together and it's hard to untangle. But we do have some special cases where you can untangle them. So I'm going to tell you one more piece of research, which is uh, uh, my research, uh, that is related to this phenomenon that I think is really interesting. And this is work with my uh, with my uh, good friend, uh, Yishin Chen, who teaches at University of Rochester. And um, and uh, here's what uh, here's what here's what uh, you should show. Um, so if um, uh, so so there are earnings announcement um, days when a bunch of major companies announce earnings on the same day, right? <laughs> because if you think earnings season lasts about a month, and they don't generally don't announce on Mondays or Fridays, so you really just have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday right? Times four weeks. So that's 12 days. So if you think there's 50 companies that are really hugely important, then there's going to be, or, or even not 50, let's say you think there are 20 companies that dominate the market. Well, then since there's only 12 days, there's probably going to be a couple of days on which three of those 20 companies are announcing on the same day. And so you might think, hmm, those are kind of major days. And we focus on, so some companies announce before the open, some announce after the close. Nobody announces in the middle of the day anymore, right? Back in the 90s, they used to announce in the middle of the day, but they don't do that anymore. So if you look at companies that announce after the close and you pick the three days each quarter, which are the most major news announcement days, you know, that is say earnings announcement days after the close, what you find is that the market goes up on those days 17 times more than on an average day. 17 times okay now i don't want to get you too excited remember on the average day the market outperforms the people by two basis points right there's about 250 trading days a year market premium is about five percent 500 basis points divided by 250 days is two basis points on these 12 days a year the market outperforms not by two basis points but by but by 34 basis points 17 times a normal day so it is a lot in other words, you're just buying the entire market index. You don't have to buy the individual stocks. The individual stocks go up twice as much. But let's just focus on the market. 12 days a year, 34 basis points a day, that is 400 basis points a year. In other words, you can capture virtually the entire market premium, but only take on the risk of market for 12 days a year, right? Why does the market go up so much on those days? Well, of course, we don't know for sure, right? This is ongoing research, and we just have speculation. But what we think is going on is that imagine that you wake up and you notice that it's Apple earnings day and you think Apple earnings are going to be amazing. Okay. So you might buy Apple stock or you might just buy the whole market. You might say it's going to be a great day for the market because the market's going to love Apple earnings. So you buy. Okay. Now suppose that you've got an identical twin who has the opposite view. They think that Apple earnings are going to be terrible. Well, if they're holding um, the market, they might go and sell some of their position, but you know they may not be invested in the market at all, right? Or they may just like not have a particular desire to sell because they don't have anything to put it into. So the upshot is there's lots of reason to think, and there's, there's a bunch of papers about this that I did not write, but that are really awesome, uh, that if there's news, the buyers are gonna buy, but the sellers aren't necessarily gonna sell so much. And you would get a tiny imbalance from the fact that it's a big earnings day for Apple and Microsoft and Exxon Mobil all on the same day. And you think, well, but how much difference could a tiny imbalance make? And what Corrigan and, uh, and debates show is a tiny imbalance can get you 34 basis points in a single day. And so 12 days a year, you can get the whole market premium and, and you hardly trade at all. So it's just one little example of an implication of this exciting research. Well, I'm already envisioning a hedge fund strategy where you only long the market for the 12 or 14 days. Well, and if you- let, let, me get, let me say a little more, Mark. There is existing research prior to our work, and, and it inspired us, it's great work by terrific researchers, that showed that similarly, Fed announcement days, the market does great, maybe 15, 20 basis points a day. Um, um, unemployment announcement days and inflation announcement days, all the big macro announcement days, are good days for the market on average not you know probably they're good 53 percent of the time 56 percent of the time i don't want to exaggerate the size of these effects it's not free money but now if you put together about 50 of the 250 trading days a year so you're trading on average one day a week you could probably get about double the average market premium so you double the market's return 
while only being in the market on one fifth of the days instead of all the days. So uh, there really is something you could put together here. Um, and uh, you know, somebody uh, is good at trading these treasures. If you hire somebody like that, Mark, have them call me. We'll talk. <laughs> well, that, that might be uh, something that we want to explore in the future. I do want to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions. So sure. there are two questions already in the queue. So let me ask you them now. Uh, Charles is asking, why did it take so long to describe and or accept the inelastic markets hypothesis? You know, oh, well, it, I, mean, these, I mean, these guys are the smartest guys in the world. And they, they had to, look, you could just say, I admit. Um, so so uh, let's see. All right, let me tell you a funny story. So when I was in grad school, I was so, so privileged to have an amazing professor named Merton Miller, who, of course, won the Nobel Prize for the Miller Medigliani dude he worked on with the MIT's Franco Medigliani. And Merton's passed away now, but uh, I learned so uh, much. And he told us this amazing story, which is that the day, you know, when you win the Nobel Prize, it's announced in Sweden um, or Norway, you know, at, uh, at, um, at nine in the morning there which is, you know, whatever, like three in the morning in the U.S. And, and, uh, and uh, so Bert was fast asleep. And then the phone rings and it's 200 reporters, you know, <laughs> wanting to ask you questions because you're the new Nobel laureate, right? And so he goes and explains, uh, and they say, can you explain the Miller, Miller Medigliani theory uh, for our readers? And he says, well, yes, what I showed is that a firm's capital structure is irrelevant to its value. And they're like, yeah, our readers aren't very sophisticated financially, you know. Uh, you know, so could you could you put that in so they'll understand better? And he said, well, it, it, what it means is it doesn't matter if you issue debt or equity. And they're like, yeah, could you dumb it down a shade further? And he's like, well, in other words, whether a firm issues stocks or bonds, it won't change the value of the company under certain conditions. And they say, could you simplify it just a little further? And he says, if you have a bunch of money in the left pocket of your jacket, and you take it out and you put it in the right pocket of your jacket, you have the same amount of money. And then the reporter said, you got a Nobel Prize for that? <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd say is Ralph and Chavier are such uh, brilliant communicators that they're able to take their sophisticated ideas and boil them down in a way that they seem so intuitive. Really, I mean, I admit, once I heard Ralph explain it, I was like, I cannot believe I didn't think of this. I'm so mad at myself. I've been in this profession, you know, 30 years since I came to grad school. I never came up with this, right? So... But that's just because they're so good. And that's the best ideas, right? The ideas that are brilliant, but you, but are so complicated that normal people like us can't understand them, uh, you know, hats off to those people. Thank God for them. But the real geniuses are people like Burton Miller and Ralph and Chavier who come up with ideas that are so deep that once, once you understand them, you feel like you always knew it. Okay, well said. We, we will, last podcast, we were three minutes over. Shame on us. This podcast, we started five minutes late because of some technical glitches on our side. So I do apologize for the late start, but we will end in two minutes. So that is my commitment to everyone here. One more question, Randy, for you. Inelis in the inelastic model considers both stocks and bond markets, but neglects to consider the impact on commodity markets, FX, crypto, and other asset classes. Yeah. Why, why did they only focus on the stock market? Yeah, the, 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 that's right. And, and they're very interested in other markets. And they do have, um, I forget if it's in the original paper, but, but Ralph mentioned in the talk I saw a couple of weeks ago in Chicago that uh, they are doing follow-up research on other markets. There's no reason whatsoever that this would apply only to equity. This is going to be a relevant thing in all markets. And here, let me tell you one more awesome thing you can trade on, and then I'll try to end one time. And that is, um, uh, let's see. Uh, in, in the 80s, a brilliant researcher at University of Illinois named Joseph Wakanashak, still doing great work, wrote a paper in which he showed the entire return of the stock market happens on the five days around the turn of the month, the last two days of the month and the, and the first three trading days of the new month, right? So in 2006, it had been 23 years since this paper came out, and um, John McConnell, a great, a great uh, professor at Purdue, wrote a paper and he said, hey, Let's see if this still works. 25 years later, the market should have figured this one out, right? And notice this is the same kind of price pressure effect that seems like it should be related. Like what happens? People get bonus checks at the end of the month, or they get a paycheck, and then they put it into the market. I mean, we don't know for sure that that's what's going on, but that's what you would think, right? McConnell looks at it, okay, 23 years after the original paper came out, the effect is stronger in the last 23 years than it was in the first 23 years, 
Okay. So then I had a friend take a look at it last year. Okay. Because 2006 is now a long time ago, 16 more years ago, 15 more years ago, but effect is still in there. Still true that the turn of the month effect is ultra powerful. So this price pressure stuff is for real. There are real opportunities here. And it is a cross. And by the way, in that paper, McConnell shows it's in bond markets and other markets. So it's a great question. It's absolutely not just stocks. All right. Terrific. Um, I, I had one other observation. It re really wasn't a question, but someone essentially said, where's, as I'll use an old commercial, where's the beef, Wendy's commercial, which most people have no idea what I'm talking about. But basically, this person was keen on hearing what your strategies are to deal with the current market. And I do think we've covered many strategies on the second yeah. half of the podcast. So hopefully that person got from the podcast what they were looking to get. But Randy, as always, you're a rock star. I know that the audience, certainly I benefit tremendously by your keen insights. So I want to thank you for myself and all the participants for a job well done. So thank you very much. Wow. Always great to talk to you, Mark. Okay, everybody. Have a great day, and Thanks. we'll Thanks talk so to you much. next week. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.